This is the Resilient Disciples podcast powered by Awana. I'm Ross. You know who you are. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Uh, today, we welcome back to the podcast um, a man who has accomplished a lot, but I would dare say being a friend of the show might be your greatest accompl- accomplishment. Uh, <laughs> senior pastor of Calvary Westlake, uh, Sean Thornton. Pastor Sean, it is great to be with you again. Great to be with you, Ross. Uh, really looking forward to this conversation. So you and I had the privilege of talking. People are going to hear this uh, in, in context. So it was several months ago at the 2021 Child Discipleship Forum. And I've had the opportunity to hear your story, to resonate with your current ministry, re- read your book, et cetera. Um, but I want to start, I find something about your story, which for those who don't know, might be surprised to hear, incredibly encouraging which is you are a living, breathing uh, testimony to, as we would say around here, the power of a loving, caring adult. For folks who aren't familiar with your story, I think it's helpful to provide some context, but can you explain how you felt the difference in with adults who surrounded you, particularly because not every adult in your life was a loving, caring adult? Yeah, I, I would say one, I grew up, you know, the short part of my story is I grew up in a Christian home, but my mom had been affected by a traumatic brain injury that left her emotionally, mentally, and physically scarred. And they just didn't do the kind of follow up after an accident where she was left unconscious for three months in 1962. They didn't do the follow up they would do today as far as occupational therapy, all the different therapies. She had learned to write, and walk, and talk, and all kinds of things all over again, as if, you know, she was starting from scratch and uh so that left her with stuff she took into the marriage uh, with my dad and into our home one brother troy and so our our setting was pretty chaotic we were going to church sunday morning sunday night, wednesday night my parents were awana leaders uh dad became the awana commander but uh mom had a lot of emotional mental short circuiting was institutionalized for a time and so there's a lot of chaos in our home throwing things screaming calm the next minute, way out of control the next. And so that church I grew up in in Northern Indiana became an oasis. And the people that church became critical to just some stability in my life, along with, you know, family and friends outside of the church. But that church, Twin Branch Bible Church in Mishawaka, Indiana, just became this oasis. They didn't know what was going on in our home. They knew that it was tough for us, but they had no idea the chaos. And so the individuals in that church, the Iwana ministry, the children's ministries, just even the, I can remember Mr. Eiswald who would greet us every Sunday morning and hand us the bulletin as we walked in the door, an elderly man. They didn't know what was going on, but they were refreshing voices and faces for me in my life just by being there. Yeah. Well, and I think I wanted to start there because I think especially at the moment, this moment in time, it becomes so easy to feel discouraged and cynical and mm-hmm none of this matters, the culture has already won kind of conversations, are, I think are very easy to have those thoughts enter our heads. And what I appreciate the most about your story coming from the, as you described it well, um, in your book, the, your home life, that the, these adults who saw you, these adults who made you feel, as again, as we would say around here, like you belonged in that church context, um, just by being themselves, they weren't they didn't have any, they weren't pastors. Um, right. you, said, you said to me once, one of them wasn't even a particularly nice person, but they were there. Right. And that made such a difference. And everyone who's listening to us talk already knows how to do that. And they're already right. doing that for so many kids in the context of their lives. Now you have the unique experience where you grew up, gained a level of platform, wrote a book and had right. some of those adults come back into your life because they, yes. saw, they saw you reflect on that. Can you share with folks who are listening to us what that process was like? Because I, I've said this before, but I came to the Lord as an adult. And one of the things that I love doing is for anybody who came to the Lord as a kid asking about it, because everyone's face lights up and they name people. They name yeah. people from 10, 20, 40, 50 years ago. And it's mm-hmm. like it was yesterday because of the profound impact. But what was it like having those adults come back into your life? Well, the way they came, one major way they came back into my life after I wrote the book, the book was released in 2016, in the summer of 2016, and Tyndale Publishers that published my book right there in the Chicago area near you, um, they they, um, organized a book signing 
at the Barnes and Noble at the University Park Mall in Mishawaka, Indiana, right there in South Bend, Indiana, where I grew up. And it got publicized, of course, on my Facebook, and it got publicized even in the local South Bend Tribune. And so I didn't know if anybody would show up. I, I had done one book signing here in, in California at a Christian bookstore that's a town away from us. And they said, we want you here for six hours on a Saturday because there'll be so many people pour in. And only one guy came the whole day. And he asked me, he said, I really like a book. And I uh, said, okay. And he, uh, he said, but I'm from the rescue mission. I can't afford it. So I ended up giving away my book at that, that one. But this was a Barnes and Noble gathering. I had no idea who would show up. And really about 50 or 60 people outside, family members and friends showed up, people I didn't expect to show up, teachers from my past, coaches. Um, and we're talking, I hadn't seen these people, some of them in 40 years. Mm -hmm. And some of the folks from my home church showed up who had been involved in children's ministry or student ministries when I was there. And it's a small church. We got at the most maybe 300 at a height. So it was a, you know, kind of a typical average church of the 1970s in, in America. And I, people would come up and they were, they, some showed up intentionally to apologize for not knowing how deep the troubles were in our home and not doing more to pour into my life. And I would just look at them. Some of them, I took their hands, some of these dear, sweet ladies who were now very elderly. And I said to them, look, you didn't need to know. You did exactly what you're supposed to do. You showed up each week at Awana. You showed up at vacation Bible school. You showed up for the children's ministry on, on Sunday for Sunday school. And you just being there. I, and I would tell them, I remember when you would stand at this point in the room, each week we'd come in. And I, I, don't, I didn't realize until I was an adult looking back. I remember coming in that room and my eyes would immediately go to where they would stand because seeing them, and, I, and again, I didn't, as a five-year-old, an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 15-year-old go, oh, I need to see Mrs. Smith today. It was just now looking back, I realized if you ask me what was my home church like, I see certain people, not just upfront teaching or leading or having, you know, having fun at youth group or in Awana or something with game time. I see people that weren't even upfront platform-wise who were there present in the room and in the space regularly with me. And that's where that that, that caring adult in the life of the child regularly showing up, you don't have to be, you know, super well-trained. You don't have yeah. to have certain spiritual gifts. You don't have to have a certain position of, of authority or what have you. Just showing up makes the world a difference. So mm -hmm. I, I let them know, don't, please don't apologize. Some with tears apologize to me. Mm -hmm. I would hug them and say, you have nothing. And I, I was, you know, Ross, I had no clue that was coming. I thought I'd see people, we'd, we'd have a nice time talking about good old days, <laughs> but I could not believe how many of my, the church folks, and some of them, their spouse had died, and they would oh, say, wow. you know, if, if Bill knew, too, he, I know he would be here apologizing, please don't apologize, you did exactly what was needed in my life, and God used you in wonderful ways. Amen to that, and I think, you know, it speaks to, obviously, we, the desire is for someone in a church ministry context to know what's going on in the life of the child. We talk about that a lot, like taking the time yeah. to know the name, the home life really does make a difference. But I want to just highlight one that ultimately God's doing the work and there are plenty right. of people God's going to put in your, in your life who are just meant to reflect his heart, nothing more, nothing less, because that in itself is so profound. And yes. that I think, you know, my wife and I have, have been foster parents, in the, excuse me, have been foster parents. I almost said foster Karens, which is an entirely different thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> um, in the past. And we, one of the things that stands out to me about, you know, caring for kids who have come from trauma is just one day of light makes a difference. Just one yep standing in a corner so that you feel safer walking into that room than you felt before you walked into that room. Yep. Literally rewires your brain and pays dividends where as you as an adult are able to use the love of Jesus that they gave you um, in your own ministry and in your own life. And that's actually what I want to bring the conversation to next, which is, you know, you operate as a senior pastor in a large church context, but I know because I've gotten the chance to know you a little bit, how critically important it is to you that loving, caring adults are everywhere within the context of your church. Right. Is that a, um, 
formal like call out that you say explicitly, you know, from the pulpit for, to the church? Is that just something that's like just in the water and people pick it up? How do you uh, say that? To, I don't know if you use the language members, but how do you say that to those who are involved in your church? Well, let me make one comment on something you said when you said that like the day you would have a, a foster kid coming out of a space of trauma, how one day of light can make such a difference when you shine Christ. I think too, those folks in my home church and people listening to us who are faithfully showing up for ministries, and they may not be the upfront crazy person or the you know wonderful Bible teacher or whatever, but they're showing up faithfully to be a part of children's ministry or student ministry is that th when you show up like that faithfully, you you're you're allowing the light of Christ to shine through you to people and in places you didn't know was needed. Mm. You, yeah. you 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 may know obviously okay this kid's coming in and we heard his parents are divorcing or this person's coming in from that neighborhood in our community that's really challenged financially. There's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of unemployment. And so you may have those things where you say we got to shine light to this person in this situation or that place. But when you're faithfully showing up, our family um, was a part of the church. We were there all the time. People knew us very well, but they had no idea. They were just being Christ by being present, that that light was shining to people, to kids, and in places they had no idea it was needed. On the side of then, how do I as a pastor emphasize that? It's funny because I would say, it, you know, it was since Resilient Disciples came out and since uh, my friend of yours, Valerie Bell, uh, started talking about the importance of the presence of a loving, caring adult regularly in life of a child. Until that point, I didn't articulate it. I, I didn't. I didn't really have anything. In, in, and even those folks who came to see me at the Barnes and Noble, I didn't know how to put what they did into a category because everything about my Bible college and seminary training and any seminar I'd ever been to or any mentor had ever talked to me, it's all about helping people know their spiritual gifts, you know, equipping them with whatever program they're using, getting them to actively, proactively engage with kids. It was all about being present in a very proactive way rather than just being present as a starting point that can make a deep impact in a child's life. Yeah. So when Valerie started using that language, I, I, I can remember where we were in the boardroom at Awana. And I remember when she used that language, there was this light bulb that went off in my head and said, that's what I've been trying to figure out. What do you call that? Where by being there, you can make an impact and you can shine light just by your faithfulness. And so prior to that conversation, which what I'm getting, you, you probably were on the team when that yeah, started was, being discussed. Mm -hmm. So what is that four years ago, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I joined been, two years ago, and it was about a year in the hopper when I started. So it was yeah, probably 2018. -ish. So yeah, so uh, you know that began to reshape how I talked to our staff. I've yeah. now talked about what the statistics Valerie shared with us, and some even some articles and things. I've talked about, it. and then you know what's happened on our staff, whether they work with children or students or not, is as I talk about the presence of a loving, caring adult in a regular way. You know that they're showing up. You kept people say, oh, there was a coach like that. He wasn't the best coach. Actually, he was a pretty bad coach. And as soon as he could get another parent to replace him, he was replaced, but he still was there at the bench, on the bench with us. People immediately know what you're saying when you say that, because everybody has that. Even if you grew up in a pretty healthy environment, healthy home, um, you still need those kinds of, um, I'll call them anchors in your life, these people yeah. who just show up. And they show up for Christ and they show up for you and you make that connection. And so for me, I'd say it's been, it's, it's only the last two years that I began to articulate that in a clear way before I would say, I would say it more like, we need you to be here. You know, kids need you in their lives um, more vague, but I think the concept of as we're recruiting volunteers of you or will, as we're challenging members that just being present Sounds like a very low threshold, but can have a deep impact. And yeah. so now we talk about it a little differently. I talk about it a lot with our children's ministry staff. And when I get to speak to volunteers, I just spoke to some volunteers. We've been able to bring back like mops and oh, yeah. other daytime programs, mostly for ladies, mostly for uh, moms and things. And pre-COVID, we'd have 800,000 moms come through in various Bible studies programs during the day and over the course of a week, daytime, you know, school time. And so we have a pretty robust 
children's ministry that does some basic child care while the moms are in some of these and some of it has programming that's not just child care but intentionally discipling the children yeah um and we just put that staff back together after almost two years you know because we, we all that stuff mm-hmm. was paused and i got to speak to them about a month ago and i did i said hey i want you to know something some of you probably think you know okay i'm going to be here to care for children keep them safe help them have fun teach them some things but i said just your presence for some kids. And I gave them a little bit of my story. I talked a little bit about what Awana's discovered and shared, even in Resilient Disciples, how the presence of a caring adult is so important. And you know what? I have, I have great response from even those who volunteer. A couple of them came up to me, saw me in the hallway and say, you know what? I never heard that described, but I had a, a person in my home church. It was the pastor's wife. It was a real small church and she just was there. So it, it's, it's become for me, now I've got some language around it. Now I'm able yeah. to couch it a little better. And I hope maybe even those listening to the podcast now, um, if you don't, and I don't know, I guess we could, they could go to the book, but there may be other resources you guys have at Awana, but, but understand what we're talking about here because there are a lot of people are intimidated about being with kids, being up front, singing, teaching, even you know, playing games with kids that would show up uh, faithfully. Yeah. Well, and I think there's a ton of, there's just a ton of great stuff there. I want to make really clear for people who are listening in real time that in the show notes of wherever you're listening, there'll be a link to learn more about Sean, a link to get Sean's book, uh, as well as a link to get Resilient, the book we're referencing in case you haven't experienced it yet. Um, But what I so appreciate about what you're sharing is that the... Yes, we have research now. We have data now. We have the ability to speak to how this is, how, how important this is. And now we also have some language. But everyone is describing that person in their life long before we had those data and those things. Yes. You know? And they couldn't I, articulate why they made a difference, right? Yes. 100%. Sometimes we'll say they had a smile. Sometimes it'd be, they ask me about my day, um, you know. But to 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 articulate it, uh, I have we have security here at Calvary. You know, we live in Southern California. We're on a major freeway, and you can we can have some of all the places I've ministered. We can have some odd characters. When I first heard, I'd have security with me every weekend. You know, walking yeah. with me sure. in the lobby and standing near me. They don't they're not wearing uniforms and all that, but they're usually off duty sheriffs, deputies, FBI agents, different different ones like that. One of the guys who works with me every Saturday night. Is an, it has been an undercover sex trafficking of minors uh, oh, detective. Wow. Yeah, so he and I was telling him about this concept, and he said, "Oh, and he's kind of you know, he's kind of a gutsy. You know, you can imagine an undercover guy working in that kind of world's got to have a little bit of certain gravitas to his, yeah. his edginess." And he, he just looks at me, goes, "Oh, no question." He said, "I can tell you if there's a loving, caring uh, adult regularly in the life of a minor." They are a thousand times. You know, just talking from experience. So this is, you know, more of an anecdotal, uh, sure, qualitative response to just some research. But he said, I can tell you a hundred percent that that child, even if they're in a vulnerable community in a, in a neighborhood filled with poverty, and maybe they're la- kind of like latchkey kids, home alone for a time or whatever. He said, I guarantee you, if there's a loving, caring adult who regularly no- regularly notices that child. They will not be sex trafficked. They will not wow. easily end up on the street. They will not end up in the hands of bad people. And just the way he talked about that again was like, okay, this is from a kid walking in a church regularly. Sorry, to this is the worst time. Yeah. Son. I apologize. My son just. That's came right. Back. So I'm just oh, gonna have no you problem. Go. Yeah, he just ran back. He just ran upstairs to take a nap. Um, okay. So if hey, you just want to take a nap. Yeah, I know, right? Um, if you wouldn't mind just picking back up at if you if we could regularly because I'll cut this so yeah. that it flows into it. If 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 a if a child could regularly have in their life, even in vulnerable communities where they can end up on the streets and drugs and gangs and and those are some of the areas where you know kids are brought into young women, young guys are brought into even underage into mm-hmm. the sex trafficking industry. If we can have a child in their life, hey, this guy was telling me. It's like a thousand times less likely they will be trafficked if there's a regular caring adult in their life. And he said, no, he just, as soon as I told him that, he was like, it's obvious. So to the most extreme uh, dangers for children, this is true, down to 
you know, I never had that kind of threat in my life. I was mm -hmm. not, I was not in that part of the vulnerable uh, category, but it still made a difference in my life. So this is, this is something that's just true about adults caring for minors and then caring Christian adults had the opportunity to reflect Jesus in a beautiful and simple way. Totally. And that's, I want to go there next because I mean, and, and I'll also extend it too. you and I essentially had opposite childhoods. However, Spike uh, was his, it was uh, the name of a high school guidance counselor. He wasn't even mine, but I adopted him as mine because he was that person for me, even though I wasn't following Jesus at the time. Like, it is such an innate need that no matter your context, you probably have someone like this. With that life. name, I picture a guy wearing a white t-shirt to school <laughs> and cigarettes rolled up in his sleeve or something. You know, Spike. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, a guidance counselor. What yeah. do the parents think? Uh, I had to go yeah. see my guidance counselor today. What's his name? Spike. <laughs> Sounds like he was hanging around the... <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to send this to him. He's really going to appreciate that. Um, <laughs> but the image I got when you said Spike, my guidance counselor, was mm -hmm. you were meeting him in the alley behind uh -huh. the school. You know, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, man, I would love to. But I'm glad him. Spike was there for you, by the way. I don't mean to belittle that he was important in your life. <laughs> no, I would love to spend the next 20 minutes talking about how funny that is. Um, but where I'm actually going to bring in the conversation is you just hit on a really key point. And I think it's helpful for folks. This is probably one of those questions. I imagine, especially after a service, people are coming up to you and asking you questions. And sometimes they're embarrassed to ask certain questions. But since it's my job to blab into a microphone, I get the privilege of raising something with you that I would imagine is often on the minds of people, but I would really appreciate you articulating, which is on a super basic level. Can you articulate for folks what the biblical, I'm going to use the word mandate to reflect that it's a leading question, but yeah. what the biblical mandate is around child discipleship. What are we as adults called to do for the next generation? Well, I think if you go all the way back to creation, of course, uh, even pre-fall, there's the, there's the call of God upon uh, Adam and Eve to uh, multiply, replenish the earth. There, there, there's something happening there that's, that's generational, that's one generation pouring in the next generation. Then you see that uh, throughout the patriarchal era, how important that is from one generation to another. Then I think the, 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 probably the cortex for me that gets down to some of this basic stuff is Deuteronomy 6, the Shema passage where, you know, heroes of the Lord our God is one, but then goes into, and how do you tell the next generation about that? How do, they, how do you tell your children and your grandchildren? Well, when you're sitting up, you're sitting, or you're sitting down, rising up, when you're walking the way, when you're going into the gates, when you're coming, it's, it's in the everyday life for us today. That's why you're driving in the car to school, uh, while you're, you know, walking out to the bus stop with your kids, while you're waiting uh, for the, the practice to start and the other kids to show up, all those different things, those are the places. And I think so for the, that is a key part of that in terms of just a principle of, and notice in those times, like Deuteronomy 6, it's not, you know, when you're formally teaching a family devotional or you're formally explaining a passage to a child, those are a part of it, but it's much simpler and much more profound that you are thinking and looking for the everyday moments in life to share wisdom with your children and grandchildren. You get into the New Testament then, of course, Jesus, when the disciples are pushing children away, he says, now let them come because it's this kind of faith that the whole kingdom, you get, these are the example of what kind of faith I'm calling people to. Then you even get into the New Testament epistles. You've got Paul, you know, commending Timothy's mother and grandmother for how they poured into him the gospel. And he's been, he's known the scriptures since he was a child that were able to make him wise unto salvation. So there's this clear thread. It's not just, you know, one place in the Old Testament or Jesus said it, or it's in the epistles. This is, this is the clear thread of scripture from, from creation forward to the church age now that we're to pour into the next generation and we're to disciple and say to kids, just like we say to adults, follow me as I follow Jesus, come to know Christ, get to know him and grow in him. And children need a context because they're taking in the world and developing so quickly that from birth to, you know, a senior in high school, and maybe even beyond that, they need godly examples who first and foremost show up and are faithfully there and present with them. And, you know, you talk about Spike. I, told, I think I told you when we talked in a couple months back that uh, I had Mr. Carson, Ed Carson was his name, and he was a widower probably was about 75 
he didn't have much of an outgoing personality. He was a very nice, kind man. We'd, you would even call him sweet. It wasn't like he was going out of his way to learn, a, you know, learn a lot about you or whatever. But Mr. Carson in the Iwana ministry then, and this is probably 1975 or so, he's, he would be standing in the corner and he was the faithful guy to keep the scores as the game leader yelled out, you know, red team, 50 points, green right. team, 20 points. He's writing on that. And he would just sit there with a the clipboard, really quiet. And he was kind of my uh, line leader on, you know, one of the colors uh, for the games. And he would, he was there every week, just present. And if you said something to him about you, you know, your dog had puppies a month later, he might say, did you name those puppies? Did people pick them up and take them? It, and, and he didn't really know how to continue the conversation. He, he wasn't that again, outgoing and nurturing, if you will. But I remember him being there. Yeah. I also remember though, he was always out there with the kids, even if he wasn't engaging with them. And there were other leaders who would take the game time to go in the hallway and talk to their friend leaders. It was like huh. a hangout time for leaders. Yeah. And I say to, I say to our children's ministry folks, those people were missing the prime time of ministry. And Mr. Carson was in the, was, was taking advantage of the prime time of ministry. He was present with the kids in the downtime of laughing and playing. And these people saw that as the silly time, the non-important time, because they were going to lead the, they were going to do the devotional they were going to listen to the verses. Um, he did those things too, but he didn't see game time as a break. He saw it as a time you just are there with the kids. And that's what we're talking about here too, is even if you are the devotional leader, which is great, if God's giving you those gifts and skills, wonderful if you're the upfront person. But don't think that's the, it's a great place of ministry, but those non-teaching times, those non-formal program times, those are the precious moments where the light of Christ shines into a child's heart. And sometimes again, shines into people, to kids and to places where you didn't know was needed. That's why those folks came and apologized to me. They didn't know I needed the light. They were trying to go after the kids who needed it. But when you're just present, always, you get an opportunity to have it shine places you didn't expect. Oh man. That's, you know, it's one of those. God things. bless Mr. Carson. God bless Mr. Carson. Indeed. Because I think, <laughs> I'm laughing at myself because we're about 110 ish episodes into this. And I do think this is the first time I asked somebody for a definition for child discipleship. So I appreciate that because I think what stands out to me about that is that I feel like the church both over broadly speaking, obviously both over complicates it and then oversimplifies it where we treat it like childcare or we treat it like it has to be this formal, thus saith the Lord. Kind it's of seminary class. Yeah, it's yeah. almost, a, yeah, it's a very deep, we've got to teach them how to argue apologetically for the resurrection. And, and there's a little of both, right? Mm -hmm. There's the just show up and have fun and care for kids. And part, unfortunately, you and I both know, unfortunately, it's been exposed through the Catholic church and even through a lot of evangelical churches that part of the lowest levels of child discipleship are to provide for the moral, physical, yeah. emotional well-being of children in that context. Sadly, we kind of assumed that was true for so many years, and now it's been exposed that it wasn't always that way. And so that's very important. Mm -hmm. um, but you're on the discipleship part, too, with kids, I think sometimes we also, the other thing we do, Ross, is we think discipleship with adults has a different definition than discipleship with kids in the yeah. sense that I think it's all, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me he's not saying just follow me though he says follow me as i follow christ and so the best thing we can give our children the best thing a, a, a want leader a children's ministry leader can give the kids in their club is that they see them growing yeah um i another memory i have of mr carson over there in the corner keeping score is at some point i heard some adult say to him one day before a club they walked up to him in his corner where he had his clipboard and he was ready to go and they said hey ed uh, i hear you're working for wheels or uh, not wheels, uh, meals on wheels. And that's the first I, I'd ever heard that term meals on wheels. And he said, yeah. And they said, do you like delivering meals to elderly people? Of course, he's elderly himself. He said, yeah. He says, uh, but a very shy guy. So he said, it's not always my thing, but I like seeing them get that meal. And, uh, you know, I'm physically able to have a car. And for me, that was seeing him growing in Jesus. So even oh, though sure. it was a very simple thing, it, it was him saying, follow me as I follow Christ just by his living that out and taking another step of serving someone else. And I think that's all that discipleship is. I know Jesus. I'm inviting you to know Jesus too. And when you come to Jesus, 
then follow me as I follow Jesus. Yeah. And that's what we're doing with children too. And that's why the caring adult becomes so critical. The kids, I mean, one day I get to heaven and I say to Mr. Carson, you know, I remember you mentioning you, you were starting to help with meals on wheels. And that really spoke to me as a kid at like eight. And he'd probably say, really, you heard that, <laughs> that you know? Yeah. Um, but, but all that's important. Totally. Well, and I think, you know, we're in a, this series of conversations that we're calling hallways and homes. And the simple thesis of this series is just that discipleship happens everywhere. And because today's kids are going into a context that is entirely different than the context that we as adults came from, we have to assume that they're already listening. We have to take advantage of every single moment because the, as we say around here, the church and the culture of 2050 is going to demand that. Um, where, where I kind of want to land the plane is for folks who, I think there is often this ability, sort of where we started, which is in this place of cynicism, where, you know, you've restarted back up a lot of program stuff, and it's 60% of what it used to be. Or it's maybe 60% is actually a dream. Maybe you're nowhere near 60% in whatever your context looks like. But discipleship is still happening. Can you explain to folks how when you're focused on discipleship as your metric of success, the numbers and the other things that can sometimes feel like noise can begin to have their proper place in the line, the long list of church or parenting priorities. If discipleship is the main thing, what happens next? Well, I think one of the assumptions too, as you were mentioning a few assumptions, one of the assumptions is not only are these kids going to grow up in a different context than their parents did or that we did, but there's also going to, we also have to realize they're being discipled by someone. These are wet sponges that are not just sitting there soaking, but they're observing, they're taking in, their eyes are open, they're physically developing fast, they're mentally, emotionally, they're their cognitive skills are coming on. Their spiritual awakeness, awakeness and, and awareness is coming on. So if we just say, oh, we're all, we, we had 100 kids before at this ministry, and now we've got 50. Oh, well, how are we going to get the other 50 back? And don't think about the 50 that are there. Yeah. Or don't think of new ways and creative ways to do this. They're being discipled by the media. They're being discipled by their friends. They're being discipled by their teachers. They're being discipled by coaches. And not all those people are going to necessarily be discipling them in the wrong direction. But the majority of the voices in their life, in this culture, even more than when I was growing up, are going to be pointing them away from the things that are near and dear to the heart of God, the things that are a part of God's kingdom values and priorities going to point them away from that. And so if the church just twiddles its thumbs trying to figure out how we get back to being what we were, or we got to wait for the right numbers or whatever each church or, or individuals within the church do, the, the discipleship that's happening from the world's perspective is key, it's getting stronger. They're finding new ways to get it to the kids and yeah. uh, more apps and more Disney pluses and Apple pluses and Netflixes and Peacocks and all kinds of stuff are coming. And we're missing the opportunity. Whereas if we even, uh, you know, in our case in Southern California, there are a lot more restrictions. You know, we, we're finding it very hard to do a WANA right now. We probably won't be able to do WANA until next fall. Mm -hmm. But I've said to our team, but whatever we do, even if you're standing in the hallway on, on Sundays between services, we got to be present in the life of kids. We, yeah. we, we can't. And we worked hard to do that online. I know a lot of the folks listening worked hard. I want to say thank you to the churches and children's ministry leaders and parents who worked very hard during the, a lot of the shutdowns and all that to, to actually stay in the life of kids. Because we sometimes think if the program isn't working, we can't get in their life. The program is the accent to what we really should be doing, which is being present in the life of a child, saying, follow me as I follow Jesus. And sometimes that's just so simple as showing up and being a regular caring adult in the life of the child. I'm smart enough to know when I found an end. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> but God bless uh, Mr. Carson, uh, Spike's last yeah, name Spike. So uh, Oh, he's Spike boy, that poor guy. Yeah. That poor guy. Yeah, his real name was Clayt. It was a nickname from his grandfather that just stuck. Uh, Fun fact. Um, and uh, But God but, bless those people. And they're in our churches now. Mm -hmm. And they are the, I think when we get to heaven, if it's possible, 
uh, if this is possible, I think they, the Mr. Carsons and the Spike types and all those individuals will kind of have the front row of heaven. And people like me that served in megachurch settings and had a little more attention or notoriety within a certain context, we get the back row. You know, the Billy Grahams and all the people we know their names will be toward the back. Whereas the people like the Ed Carsons, uh, I think, because I think Jesus lived that way. You know, I mean, it's how he lived. He was just present at, at a meal at a rich man's house and the poor people were there waiting for scraps. And by his presence, great ministry came out of it just by totally. being present. And so I, I really think that what you're talking about, and I hope people get the vision for this. And I hope those who maybe have felt guilty that they didn't know something about a child's life can just say, thank you, God, for giving me the opportunity to be in that child's life. What a blessing. Amen.